Yo, what's up, y'all? I'm Sean Croxton of UndergroundWellness.com, hanging out with Dr. Tom O'Brien, host of the Gluten Summit. Dr. Tom, 110,000 people yes. are attending this summit right now. Did you ever think that it was going to be this huge? No, no, Sean, not in the least. My goal, our goal, our dream, our prayer was maybe 10,000, 15,000 people. That was a number that I couldn't imagine happening. Mm -hmm. what, do you have, what do you have to say about all of this? I mean, I've hosted some of my own and they do pretty darn good, but never this big. Like, what do you have to say for yourself? It's unbelievable. It is just unbelievable, the response. And it really goes to show that this message, people have wanted to hear more. They've wanted to find out what is this thing and how do I identify it and what do I do about it? That it is a primary topic. Gluten sensitivity is not a fad diet. It's not going away. It's going to get more and more known. So now with this summit, tens of thousands, over 100,000 people now know more accurate questions to ask. So the, you know, we've talked about this before that uh, the average is 17 years from the time translational research. And translational means a researcher publishes some information and it changes the way doctors think. The average is 17 years by the time translational research is published before it's used in practice, before wow. the doctors are using it. 17 years. So when they first wrote about cholesterol, and it might be associated with cardiovascular disease, 17 years before the doctor down the street was testing for cholesterol. That's not going to happen with gluten sensitivity. And now there are over 100,000 people that have a much larger understanding of what possibly, maybe could happen if you have a gluten sensitivity. On my Facebook page, I like to post, uh, there's these things called uh, some e-cards. And they're just really funny e-cards. And sometimes I'll look up ones on gluten to post to my page. Um, and they're mostly making fun of gluten sensitivity and people who are gluten free. So do you feel like this summit kind of validated people and what they've been saying about their health and being gluten free? So many of the emails are thank yous for validating people, so many of them. The woman who wrote about her 21 year old son that committed suicide, he was a celiac and he, he maintained his depression all through high school years going into college, even strictly being gluten free. And she wrote to say thank you so much, perhaps my son had cross reactivity to dairy because 50% of celiacs have a sensitivity to dairy and their body thinks they're still eating gluten. That's what a cross reactivity means. 50% of them, that's in the literature. And when our panelists talked about that, she wrote and said, maybe that's what happened to my son. Thank you so much for sharing that information. People feel validated. They, they, they finally, they're able to take this information to their families and say, look, listen to this world researcher. And this is what I've been feeling, the migraines or the seizures or the attention deficit. Absolutely, people are feeling validated by this. Yeah. So this is uh, day eight of the Gluten Summit, and I feel like before we move on, we should probably do some, some credits oh, thank real you. quick. Thank you because, very much. I mean, I've done these myself and, and myself, and I know that they're not done by ourselves. We have teams who work with us. So talk about your team. Oh, thank you, thank you. And the first thing I want to do is thank my team. It's an unbelievable team, and they have been working 14, 16 hour days, seven days a week, I'm not exaggerating, now for a couple of months. The last month has been seven days a week. And I'm, I can't forget anybody. So Karen, Bob, Bobby, Alexandra, Allison, Ann, Patty, Laura, Crystal, Dave, Brooks, Carrie, Dan, Ian, Crystal, and Michelle. That's our team. You know, I didn't do this by myself. I actually had the easiest job. I just have to talk. And I just have to interview and share my knowledge, but it's behind the scenes, all the work that's done. And there's another group that I want to acknowledge because they had such a, a, a silent role to play, but a huge role. My friends Bobby Chang and Yermis Bariota introduced me to this entire concept of the internet. And I've, I've been online for years, but I d didn't know anything about summits. I didn't know what these were. And I was interviewed four years ago in this room by you? Was that? Well, maybe two or three years ago, something okay. like that, yeah. Uh, two to three years ago. And then I met Bobby and Yermis after that. So this first interview here uh, on Underground Wellness, this guy goes, yo, what's happening, everyone? This is Sean <laughs> yo, Cox. Yo, what's up, y'all? And I'm like, what is, who is this guy? And uh, what I've come to learn, this is very cute, I think. So I, I wrote this down so that I would get it. 
If you're under 30, you get it, what Sean's talking about when he does his thing. <laughs> if you're under 40, you think you get it. If you're under 50, you want to get it. If you're under 60, you remember when you got it. And if you're, over, if you're under 70, you say, get what? Right? <laughs> so there's this world of understanding of how to use the internet. I had no grasp of this at all, absolutely no grasp. And my friends Bobby and Yermas introduced us to it, and then you have been my mentor, and you have taught me and my team how to do this, how to get this message out. So in front of 110,000 people, I want to thank you. My pleasure. For your guidance on this. Thank you very much. Definitely my pleasure. You also had affiliates around the world promoting this for you. I mean, that's how a lot of folks found out about this, right? Yes, yes, that's something that you taught me and other people have taught me that we've asked others to help us, uh, doctors, healthcare practitioners, uh, peop uh, opinion leaders, people who have followings. We've asked them to announce it to their groups, to send it out to their lists of people. And the result has been, we have 110,000 people here. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So, so the big question, I mean, you're obviously passionate, passionate about this, yes. but you didn't have to do this. So why did you? I'm going to tell you the story about uh, my family. Um, and a few have heard this before, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, I got a call one day that my godmother was being rushed to the hospital. I said, what's wrong? What's wrong? They didn't know, some type of stomach pain. And her health history was that she had, she's only in the hospital twice in her, three times in her life, two natural childbirths and a car accident in her 60s, broke her hip, she's in the hospital for a week. Never took any medications except for um, pain medication for a year with a broken hip. Uh, every year she'd get a physical and her doctor would say, Emily, you're as healthy as a horse, but you have to stop drinking. And she'd say, I don't drink. And the doctor would go, uh-huh, and then move on to something else. And she had mildly elevated liver enzymes in her blood test. And every doctor knows you often see mildly elevated liver enzymes with no indicators of a liver problem. Um, and so you wait and you watch to see, has anything happened? Next year, she have a physical. Emily, you're as healthy as a horse, but you've got to stop drinking. I don't drink. What's the matter with you? I told you last year, I don't drink. That was my godmother. That's how she talked to her doctor, right? And, and he, uh -huh, and then move on to something else. Well, when you have mildly elevated liver enzymes, liver enzymes are a measure of dead liver cells. And we all lose liver cells every day. We make liver cells every day and we lose some every day. So there's a number that's the average and that's safe and healthy is you want to be making as many as you're losing. Right? And so that's the number. She had mildly elevated liver enzymes, which meant that she was losing more liver cells than she was making. This went on for years and years. And no other signs of a problem, no symptoms, nothing at all. She was fine, fine. And then one day she's rushed to the hospital with severe abdominal pains. They find out that she has 4% of her liver left functioning, 4%. 96% of the liver is completely scabbed. It's called sclerosed. It's just all tough tissue. Blood can't go through there. So now you have all the blood in the body goes through the liver. Now all the blood in the body is going through 4% of the liver. Mm. Now in an 82-year-old woman, that 4% of the liver that's handling 100% of the blood, you know, she's kind of a little frail like any 82-year-old woman. What happens to those blood vessels? When 4% of the blood vessels in the liver are now having to handle 100% of the blood, the pressure builds up and they burst. It's called internal bleeding. Oh, oh, severe pain. They rush her to the hospital. They find out the problem. They do emergency surgery. They save her life. I'm calling, say, how's Aunt Emily? What's wrong? What's wrong? And when I find out, I talk to her daughter, my cousin. I said, Cindy, have the doctor do this test, transglutaminase and deaminated glidens. And now many of you remember from some of the interviews that those are tests for celiac disease. And um, I didn't hear about that and turns out my godmother had six emergency surgeries in eight weeks. Six. B the blood vessels keep bursting. What are you going to do for an elder? What are you going to do? Um, you've got to, you know, they're, they're not going to give her a new liver. So finally the doctor says, Emily, go home. We can't do any more surgery. Make your peace. How much time do I have? We don't know. Two weeks, two months. We don't know. It'll be quick. That's when I flew to Pittsburgh to say goodbye to my godmother. And um, 
You ever say goodbye to someone that's known you longer than you've known you? You know, it's really hard to do. Uh, I stayed three days. I woke up one morning. I, go, I wake up early. I went out in the living room. She's in the living room. I said, she's sitting on the couch. I said, what are you doing? Do you, she said, I can't sleep. And I said, lay down. She said, I'm too old for you. <laughs> that was my godmother. <laughs> I said, I know, I know. But if I can't have your body, I want your blood. Lay down. And I'd brought a barrel and needle in the tube, and I drew her blood because that blood was never drawn by the doctor. And uh, segue, when I called my cousin, uh, and I said, Cindy, well, what happened to that blood test? She said, oh, the doctor said you're probably a nice man, but you really don't know what you're talking about. Mm. And there's so much literature on this, on celiac disease causing mildly elevated liver enzymes and slowly destroying the liver. Mayo Clinic writes about this. But the test was never done, so I did the test. I called the laboratory, said, this is Dr. O'Brien from Chicago. I lived in Chicago at the time. This is Dr. O'Brien from Chicago. Come get this blood. And they did. She was a celiac patient. And um, I told them, I said, Annalie, I don't know how much time you have, but I guarantee you, uh, you're going to feel better if you don't eat gluten anymore. And she said, okay, okay. She didn't live two weeks. She didn't live two months. She lived a year and a half, Sean. Wow. A year and a half with that same liver, blood still going through that same liver with all those vulnerable, damaged blood vessels. But the blood vessels didn't burst anymore. And when I talk about this in my lectures to doctors, I say, docs, what happened? What was the hemodynamics, the blood, the blood vessels? What happened to the blood vessels that they stopped bursting? No one knows. The research has never been done on it, but she lived a year and a half. And uh, uh, I'd call multiple times a week, see how she's doing. And uh, the family was always over there because my godmother could die at any minute. Any minute. Uh, you, you, you never knew if when you said goodbye, it'd be the last time you'd see her. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, a year and a half later, I got the call any day because she progressed into liver cancer, which advanced liver cirrhosis often does. She got liver cancer, and that progressed to brain cancer. She didn't have any pain for any of this, though. There was no pain, no medications, until the last five days or so. And uh, they said, any day. So I flew to Pittsburgh immediately to say goodbye to my godmother. And she weighed 53 pounds. You know, the, the cancer had eaten her up. And um, I'm sitting at the side of her bed, and I feel it. You know, every time I talk about it, I still feel it. My head's in her lap. She's, I'm crying. She's stroking my hair. And I lift my head up. I'm all teary-eyed and look at her. She's teary-eyed. And she looked at me, and she said, thank you, Tommy. Thank you. And I'm sobbing now, right? And then she gets this fire in the eye the way that she could. And she said, you tell them, you tell them. And I said, I will, Aunt Emily, I will. That's why I've been teaching about gluten sensitivity for years now, because she died shortly thereafter, and her death certificate said hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer. It should have said liver cancer secondary to celiac disease. Mm -hmm. My father died of a heart attack, and uh, they couldn't figure out why he died. Uh, the pathologist called me after the autopsy. We don't know why your dad died. I said, what do you mean? Well, he had 30% blockage in his left descending coronary. That's called the widowmaker. That's not, you don't want atherosclerosis there. But he only had 30%. It's not enough. And there was no evidence of a clot. So they thought there was foul play. They checked his blood for toxicity. They looked for needle marks. They did lung biopsy, see if he breathed anything. They couldn't figure out why he died. And that sent me on a hunt. And what it came down to was he had an elevated homocysteine level, which Dr. Houston talked about in, here in the Gluten Summit about homocysteine. And uh, he had an elevated homocysteine level. And what I found out is that elevated homocysteine levels cause a vasospasm, the blood vessel spasms. So I called the lead researcher in the world on homocysteine, Dr. Kilmer McCulley. And I said, Dr. McCulley, will hyperhomocysteinemia, an increased homocysteine level, cause vasospasm. I know it will. He said, yes. I said, well, that ba can that vasospasm occur at the site of a 30% blockage, making it effectively a 100% blockage? And he said, we see it in the lab all the time. And that's how my dad died, is that he had an elevated homocysteine level that caused his blood vessel to spasm, so no blood in the widowmaker got to the heart. He had a heart attack. 
he died and the blood vessel relaxed back to its 30% blockage. Mm. Now, why do you have elevated homocysteine level? Because it's a deficiency in folic acid, B6, B12, and trimethylglycine, the B vitamins, which are the most common water-soluble vitamin that's deficient in celiac disease. So that's how my dad died. I've got hyperhomocysteinemia. My sister does, my brother, my cousins do. It's genetic and it's so easy to fix. You just got to take the B vitamins and you're fine. Now I'll tell you about my mother. My mother developed something called toxic metabolic encephalopathy. What that means is that the liver and the bloodstream is so toxic that the, the exhaust, if you will, the toxins in the blood, they get to the brain and the brain doesn't function so well anymore. You can't think clearly. Sometimes it looks like a stroke. My mother died from toxic metabolic encephalopathy, which was secondary to celiac disease. Once again, liver damage caused by gluten sensitivity that um, uh, got worse and worse and worse. And you know, my mother believed in her doctor. She loved her doctor and he wouldn't check her for celiac disease, and I talked to him a couple of times, and he just, ah, okay, okay, but he would never talk to her about it, and she loved her doctor. She believed in her doctor. had been the family doctor for 30 years. Uh, I have three f immediate family, the closest mentors, family mentors in my life that all died from gluten sensitivity in one way or another, and that's what happens in your family. It's your parents, it's your brother, it's your daughter, it's your son, the 21-year-old with depression. I mean, there are so many conditions that may be caused by gluten sensitivity. That's why I'm doing this, is that we need to just consider, could it be gluten, when you don't get the results you want from trying to be healthy, could gluten sensitivity be part of the problem? Mm -hmm. And I'm on a mandate from my godmother. I have to do this. Yeah, doing a good job of it. That's right. So you've got this summit going on, it's almost over. 29 different presentations. I know it's a hard question, my friend, but give us some of the big impact moments. It's one of the things that uh, I'm so grateful for, that um, uh, my girlfriend's family is watching and they text all the time. You know, they're a communicative family and they're texting all the time. And they vote for who should be on the um, Encore Day. Encore Day, yes, thank you. Who should be on the Encore Day? So far they voted that 26 of the 29 should be on the Encore Day. That's because they haven't heard the last three yet, right? So, so what that tells me is that people are getting it. They're listening, they're finding value in it, um, and for each individual there's different value. You know, where, where your interests are, if you have cardiovascular disease in your family, maybe Dr. Houston's was most important for you. If you have Alzheimer's in your family, maybe Dr. Perlmutter's was most important for you, or Dr. Hajivasalu's. Uh, everyone will get the value from where their interests are. My goal is that everyone get the big picture. That's my goal. What's the big picture? The ones that I would want to listen to again. You want the big picture, aside from all of the very important components of what everyone has said, what's the big picture? It's Dr. Marsh, the godfather of celiac diagnosis, Dr. Umberto Volta, who's on today with me, the godfather of non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and Dr. Yehuda Schoenfeld on today also, the godfather of predictive autoimmunity. You listen to those three again and again and again, and you will get it, that the primary cause for us getting sick and dying is when our gut is being damaged from some inflammatory process, whatever it's caused by, that's causing inflammation in the gut, causing damage to the gut that sets us up for the development of autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. That's the primary message I hope you have an, um, an aha about, and maybe not with a lot of deep understanding of the technical stuff, right. but if you listen to those three again and again, Michael Marsh, Umberto Volta, Yehuda Schoenfeld. If you listen to those three, they're the godfathers and they've devoted their lives and they're the best at what they do. Mm -hmm. And these are the people that a hundred of the 110,000 people here, 100,000 people would never have had a chance to hear them. Right. Because they don't talk to the general public, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're not 
speakers, they're researchers. But if you, if you listen to them and you understand this dynamic, this is the primary dynamic I want the world to see because if our healthcare practitioners understand this dynamic, they'll just consider it when someone comes into the office and their initial recommendations don't get great results. They'll consider maybe there is a sensitivity here from an environmental toxin and the most common environmental toxin is gluten. Right. That's why we talk about gluten, not because of any other reason. It's the most common environmental toxin that damages your gut. The godfathers, they can get a bit scientific. So for the newbies out there who are just entirely new to this whole gluten sensitivity thing, who should they listen to first? Hands down, Dr. Rodney Ford, the pediatric gastroenterologist. Dr. Ford talks from the viewpoint of how it affects children, but he talks so common sense about how gluten affects the body in general. And so he's an uh, easier to understand, not the real technical terms kind of guy that mm -hmm. just puts it in common sense language that, um, uh, with good visuals so that everyone can get um, oh, that's what that means. Okay. Gotcha. Dr. William Davis is kind of the same way, right? Makes it very understandable. Dr. Davis makes it very understandable also. Right. He's uh, the author of the, wheat, uh, the book Wheat Belly, and uh, it's a fabulous book. Uh, he has good analogies also. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to read that book, Wheat Belly. That's Man, an excellent book. It's been book. like a bestseller forever, it seems like. Yeah. A Grain of Truth. When I first saw that you named the summit A Grain of Truth, I was like, that's, that's catchy. That's good, Dr. O'Brien. Yeah. Why'd you name it that? because we all needed to know the truth about this grain gluten and that no human can digest it. When you listen to Dr. Fasano's talk, no human can digest it. Whether or not you get symptoms will be dependent on how much damage has been done and when you cross the imaginary threshold, now your body can't compensate anymore. Now look, here's the thing about wheat, is that there, you, you can't argue, it has saved millions and millions of lives. We've sent big container ships of wheat to third world countries when they're starving, and it saves a lot of people's lives, no question about it. So you can get some value out of it. You can use the protein out of it to some degree, but the proteins cause damage. And the damage you don't feel, most people don't feel immediately, but down the road is when it gets you. And here come the autoimmune diseases and the degenerative diseases and the diabetes. And as Dr. Davis explains, uh, the blood sugar problems and the obesity and the type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, it has saved millions and millions of lives, but no, it's not a food for humans. Mm -hmm. A two-part question for you. You've mentioned autoimmunity a few times, and of course that came up many times during the summit. What is autoimmunity, number one, and what do you mean when you say that it could be the number one cause of morbidity and mortality in the industrialized world? I yes, yeah. yes. Autoimmunity is when the immune system is attacking your own tissue. It attacks your heart or your lungs or your brain or your legs or your muscles or your bones. Wherever you pull at a chain, it breaks at the weakest link. You know, it's at one end, the middle, the other end. It's your heart, your liver, your brain, your kidney. Wherever your weak link is, that's where you're going to have a problem. Where, now, now, the pull is what we call stress. So, oh, I'm so stressed. Well, it's pulling on the chain, and you'll get the symptoms wherever the weak link in the chain is. Gluten pulls on the chain, right? But it's, that weak link is where the immune system is going to attack you because there's, there's a, it's a complicated mechanism. I won't go there right now, but it's the immune system attacking self. When the immune system is attacking self, let's say it's attacking brain, it's killing off brain cells. And you can't feel it if you lose um, 300 brain cells. You can't feel it because you've got billions. But after you've lost um, 300 million brain cells, you start joking with your friends, oh, I'm getting old, I can't remember the way I used to, ha ha. Oh, how old are you? Oh, I'm 36. Hmm. It's like, no, no, you're supposed to be able to learn a new language when you're 80. Yeah. You know, our brains are supposed to work. Uh, and it's an ongoing process. You don't feel when your body's attacking self until there's been so much damage, now it's obvious, and you've got arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, or you've got skin problems, or you've got brain dysfunction, or you've got... Um, uh, lupus. Lupus. Hashimoto's. Exact thyroid, yeah. Hashimoto's thyroid, or recurrent miscarriages from an autoimmune mechanism, and all of a sudden there's these symptoms, where'd they come from? I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm being healthy, I don't know where they came from. Well, where they came from is an accumulative damage that's been going on and on and on. There's a really good article that um, everyone should read 
Uh, it's in Scientific American, March of 2007. The cover story, Predictors of Disease, and it's from Natkins at UCLA. He's an immunologist at UCLA, and he talks about how the immune system protects us, but sometimes it's attacking our own tissue. And that'll occur for years before you ever get symptoms. So if you can identify where your body is being attacked right now, and, you, and it, it's, a, uh, it's a truth moment, you say, whoa, really? My body's attacking my thyroid right now? I feel fine. But what do you mean it's attacking my thyroid? I feel fine. Well, that's because it hasn't killed so much tissue that now you've got the symptoms, Hadn't right? gotten bad enough. That's right. So you've got this window of opportunity to take a pause, back up a little bit, and see what's pulling on the chain. That's the value of predictive autoimmunity. Now, why is autoimmunity the number one cause of morbidity and mortality? Many studies have shown that it's the number three cause of getting sick and dying. Many studies have shown that. But many studies have also shown that atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, the mechanism of cardiovascular disease, the number one cause of death, the early stages of atherosclerosis, and Dr. Houston talked about this, the early stages of atherosclerosis are an autoimmune process. Mm -hmm. So if you include that, autoimmune processes become the number one cause of getting sick. So whether it's number one or number three cause of getting sick and dying, it's right up there. And the whole purpose of A Grain of Truth, the Gluten E Summit, is to recognize this mechanism, to understand it for yourself, and then to find out what's pulling on my chain. Is it gluten that's pulling on my chain? And if it is, and you take gluten out, all of a sudden, your body starts to relax and your migraines go away or your joint pains go away, your energy goes up, or whatever the symptom pattern is, wherever the weak link was in your chain. Hmm. I forget who I was listening to or who I was watching with the summit, but he talked about the difference between normalizing the immune system and boosting the immune system when you've got autoimmunity going on. Talk about that. Yes. We think that if your immune system is attacking your thyroid, as an example, there's something wrong with the immune system. No, there's not. Not most of the time, your immune system is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It's trying to protect you. So rather than trying to shut down the immune system, what we want to do is say, what's pulling on the chain? What am I doing in my life that's pulling on my chain? Do I have heavy metal poisoning from eating too much tuna for too many years? And is the mercury toxicity accumulating, causing my thyroid dysfunction? There are many studies that show that. Uh, do I have gluten sensitivity? Is that the cause? Uh, what's pulling on the chain. And when you identify what's pulling on the chain and you stop pulling on that chain, the result is that the symptoms often calm down all by itself. So we don't want to think of the immune system as being dysfunctional when you've got rheumatoid arthritis. We want to think of the immune system as it's overactive right now. That's true. But do we want to shut down the immune system or do we want to look at why is it overactive? Many times it's a value to look for why and get the why out of there. Stop pulling at the chain. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of the summit. And, and the, that's what Dr. Schoenfeld talks about today. And the why can be gluten. The why is often gluten. Dr. Fasano showed us there are two things that, hands down, no questions asked, the studies are very clear, cause intestinal permeability, the leaky gut. Two things, gluten and lipopolysaccharides. And that's a topic that we're not talking about in this summit, is LPS. This is the gluten summit. Children's health, incredibly important topic, especially when it comes to this. Talk about kids and, and their risk. Yes. There's um, two components that I want to talk about. The first one is the incredible increase in attention deficit uh, that we're seeing nowadays compared to 15 or 20 years ago that many, many children are being diagnosed with attention deficit and unable to participate in schools with the focused attention that is being asked of them. Their brains are extremely vulnerable and it's such a toxic world we're living, we're living in now that uh, kids are paying the price. Here's one study that I don't think I've talked about in the summit at all. And in Sweden, they've got socialized medicine. They've got records on everybody. And for, I'm not sure if it's 30, 40 years, it's at least 30 years, maybe 40 years, they've been taking a drop of blood at birth from the baby, the fetal blood, and they put it on a card and they dry it and they store the card. They've got 50 million cards, you know, they've got on everybody. So they developed the technology to look at 
the IgG antibodies in that blood at birth. Now, IgG antibodies, this is very cool, that when the baby's in utero, mom's immune system starts preparing the baby to come out into the environment where mom lives. Maybe mom lives in New York City, maybe mom lives in a rice, outside a rice field in Dubai, I don't know, there's no rice fields in Dubai, <laughs> India, right? right. <laughs> but the environment, wherever the environment is that mom lives, mom's immune system, immune system starts preparing the baby for that environment. How does she do that? Here's some IgG antibodies. Mom sends them down to the baby. Here's some antibodies to cats. We've got a couple of cats at home. They're nice cats. You don't have to freak out about these cats. So mom's body puts IgG antibodies into the baby, so baby is born and is okay with cat dander and doesn't have a reaction. Or we live in the woods. Leaves decay in the woods, so there's some mold in the air because of the decaying leaves. Here's some antibodies to the mold that's in our air by our home. It's okay, you don't have to freak out about it. So baby comes out into the world and is taken home and there's mold in the air and the baby's immune system is fine with it, adapts to it right away. That's the purpose of IgG antibodies. So they looked at IgG antibodies in this drop of blood on the card uh, for the protein in wheat called gliadin. What did they find? Those babies that had, had mom's IgG antibodies in the top 10%, those babies had a 70% increased risk of developing schizophrenia 30 years later as wow. an adult. 70% increased risk. And if the IgG antibodies were in the top 5%, not top 10%, but the top 5%, I mean the highest of the high, those babies had a 240% increased risk of developing schizophrenia 30 years later. When I talk about that in our seminars, the doctors sit there and they go, We've never heard of anything like this before. So then I say, so docs, what do we do with this information? Because this is a first study ever, 2013, first study ever like this. What do we do with the information? Here's what you do. All pregnant women get checked for sensitivity to gluten. If they're sensitive to gluten, you take gluten out of their diets right now, you send them to a nutritionist, a registered dietitian who's trained in gluten sensitivity, so that they get recommendations for a healthy, nutrient-dense diet to eat during the pregnancy. At least during the pregnancy because there's a correlation between having these antibodies to gluten and baby's brain not developing properly 30 to 40 years later. We don't know why, but we know the connection is there. So kids are at such great risk now. There was a study published in 2007 that most of the world has not paid any attention to and it was published in the major journal, Gastroenterology. What did they say? They said children diagnosed with celiac disease have a 3.2 fold, that means three times more likely to die five years out or more than non-celiac kids. They're gonna die early in life, with or without a gluten-free diet. Hmm. With or without a gluten-free diet. So you diagnose a child with celiac disease, you put them on a gluten-free diet, they're three times more likely to die early in life than children that don't have celiac disease. What does that tell us? That tells us we're not complete in the way we're treating these kids. Of course you put them on a gluten-free diet. That's the prerequisite. Stop throwing gasoline on the fire. Of course you do that. But what else do you have to do? You have to heal the damage that's been done already. You have to heal the damage. Here's the analogy. It takes 976,000 mousetraps to fill up a football field laid side by side. And I know the guy that figured this out. He used to wear a pocket protector. He's that kind of guy. He's brilliant. Jeffrey Bland. Jeffrey Bland. <laughs> now he wears shirts that don't have pockets anymore, so he doesn't have pocket protectors. <laughs> <laughs> 976,000 mousetraps. Cock each mousetrap. Put a ping pong ball on each mousetrap. Walk along the sidelines with one ping pong ball, just a ping pong ball. Now you have this huge football field out there with 976,000 mousetraps on it, cocked with ping pong balls on them. So it looks like one big ping pong ball out there, a field of ping pong balls. Take your one mousetrap, or one ping pong ball, throw it out on the field. 
it hits one mousetrap, pop. Now there's two ping pong balls in the air, the one you threw out there and one in the mousetrap that just popped. They hit two mousetraps, pop, pop. Now there's four ping pong balls in the air, pop, 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 pop. Now there's eight, pop, 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 16, pop, 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 pop. And you have what's called a cascade reaction. And this thing has a life of its own. And the initial irritant, that ping pong ball that you threw out there, it's long gone. It's long gone. But this thing has a life of its own. That's oxidative stress for our healthcare practitioners. That's oxidative stress. Gluten sensitivity causes damage via oxidative stress, right? Stop eating gluten. That's a prerequisite. But you still have pop, 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 pop going on throughout your body. That's why there's increased mortality with or without a gluten-free diet. That's why if you're diagnosed with celiac disease after the age of 60, you have a threefold increased risk of dying in the next year compared to someone who's 60 that was not a celiac on a gluten-free diet. So you're diagnosed with celiac at 60 or older, you go on a gluten-free diet, you're three times more likely to die in that year than someone that's not a celiac. Now after one year it levels off, but why in that year? Because pop, 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 pop is still going on. You have to put the fire out. You have to put the fire out. That's why I've put together a PowerPoint presentation for our healthcare practitioners who are part of this summit. And so for any of you where your healthcare practitioner sent you the link that said, please check this out, you're going to enjoy this, they are getting PowerPoint presentations, a summary of the entire summit. So they can summarize for you, probably in an evening discussion group or however they're going to do it, whatever they choose to do it, but I'm giving them the PowerPoints so that they can summarize for you the entire event. And then where do we go from here? What do we do? For those that were not brought to the summit by a healthcare practitioner, I will do that for you. We will announce the webinar sometime next week probably that we will be given, the webinar will be in two or three weeks. We'll announce it to you next week as to when it is. It's gonna be free and then I will summarize it all for you. So Doc, before we wrap, what can our audience do before the upcoming webinars? What can they do right now to improve their health? Time and time again, when people do this, the vast majority of people comment later and say, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Let me say it differently. Wow. wow. Right. <laughs> They're so surprised by the results. Just try this. Try this for two weeks. Set yourself up to do it properly, but for two weeks, no gluten of any type and no dairy of any type. How do you set yourself up? You have rice pasta at home if you normally make pasta. You have gluten-free breads at home if you normally eat breads or make sandwiches. You have uh, gluten-free soy sauce if you like cooking Chinese flavored things or you use soy sauce. Set yourself up. Listen to what some of the nutritionists have said in this summit of how to prepare and how to do gluten-free. But give yourself two weeks as a trial. Two weeks, no gluten, no dairy. Not less gluten and less dairy. No gluten and no dairy. You can't be a little pregnant. You can't have a little gluten. Give yourself just a couple of weeks and notice if there's a change in how you sleep, in your energy level, in your joint pains, in the, your stiffness in the morning when you wake up, in the frequency of your headaches, in the intensity of the um, uh, hormone imbalances, if, if you have that. Uh, just notice what happens to your body. If there's a change, subtle or dramatic, if there's a change, then consider gluten sensitivity and get the test done. Does that mean that it's okay to have like gluten-free muffins and all these processed foods? Is that okay? That's really a good question. You know, then there's a big debate about gluten-free diets are not healthy for you, they're dangerous for you. No, they're not. A gluten-free diet's not bad for you. A bad gluten-free diet is bad for there you. There you go. Right? <laughs> you, you, you think? You know, so if you were going to, uh, if you stop at the coffee shop every day on your way to work in the morning and you get your coffee and you get a blueberry muffin or a pastry of some type, but now you've gone gluten-free and so you go get, get your coffee and just look at those muffins and say, oh, I wish I could, but no, I'm gonna stay good because I'm feeling better, I'm not gonna do that. And then one day you go in there and all of a sudden you see the sign, they've got gluten-free muffins. Oh, I can have that, it's healthy. It's healthy, it's good for me. No, it's not. It's just not 
bad for you. It doesn't mean it's good for you, right? right. So if you have a blueberry muffin that's gluten-free once in a while, who cares? It's fine. But you can't have one a day. Matter of fact, it's healthy for me. I can have two. You know, or you eat a box of cookies instead of one gluten-free cookie. You eat the whole box. But, so you have to take some common sense yep. when you do these types of things. In general, for most people, gluten-free products should be okay to have on occasion in general. That's a whole other discussion, almost a summit in itself. But in general, you should be okay with having some gluten-free products once in a while. Tomorrow is Encore Day. How does the audience vote for that? Ah, yes, Encore Day is, um, you get to vote, who do you want to hear again? And we will send you the emails today uh, with the instructions on how to vote and uh, click here and who's your favorite and you want to hear it again. And just let us know and we're going to air those four uh, interviews again for you. So we're wrapping up. Can't believe it. I remember when we first start, started talking about this, the first time we went out to eat, you're like, I want to do an e summit. And I was like, let's do an e summit. Let's do the thing, right? <laughs> now, now it's coming to an end. Yeah. What's next? Where do we go from here? Ah, uh, well, um, your doctors with their guidance and the summary PowerPoints of this summit, and where do you go from here? We'll let your healthcare practitioners talk to you about that if they recommended you uh, to come here. For those that don't have a healthcare practitioner, we will do the webinar. It'll come in about two weeks, maybe three. And the webinar will be, what, how do you apply this information? What kind of tests should I do? What kind of thing, how do I start to stop the pop, 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 pop? That's a whole discussion in itself. You know, I, I wanna take a moment on this, if I can. You've been raised to believe that if you have a symptom, find the right pill, symptom goes away, you're fine and then you keep taking the pill. Well, we've learned that doesn't work so well. That there's, you know, in the United States, we spend more on healthcare than any other country in the world, and we're ranked second from the bottom by the World Health Organization. Second in the bottom in quality of healthcare in industrialized nations, but we spend more than anyone else in the world. Something's not working. And it's the way we think about this. We think that we can ignore what's going on in our bodies if we just take a pill that covers up the pain. Well, the analogy to that is you're driving your car down the road and the hot light comes on, you say, uh-oh, and you pull over right away, but you know what to do, you know what to do. So you pull over, you turn the car off, and you get down underneath, uh, the, and you look up under the dashboard, you find the wire that goes to the hot light, you cut that wire, and then you start the car and you see, oh, the hot light's not on anymore, I'm fine, and then you drive away. That's what most medications that are taken long-term are doing is cutting the wire to the hot light. So we need to shift how we think about this. We need to shift, all right, my body has this problem right now, what do I do about it? The first thing you wanna do is recognize you've been pulling at the chain and the link's broken, here come the symptoms, whatever they are. So the first thing is stop pulling at the chain and then heal the link. That's what people have to learn and that's not one pill. And we'll talk about that in the upcoming webinar. From what, I, from what I understand, you're already thinking about your next summit, but you know, we'll keep that down low right now. <laughs> the people have spoken. They've sent in their comments, their testimonials, they posted on Facebook. Oh my gosh, yes. You got a paper right here with I do. stuff written on it. I do, you know, we have a team of nine that are reading everything that's coming in and trying to answer questions because there are thousands of them. But there's just a couple here that they picked out that they're just fabulous. This is from Faye in Canada. Thank you. You're doing such a wonderful, important job. It's so needed to have the medical community talk about causes and prevention. You are the Renaissance healthcare providers of our time. It creates hope for all of us. A heartfelt thank you. And Charlotta in Sweden. Every moment of this urgent information is like a valuable gift wrapped up in golden paper and bright curly ribbons. This is what you and your team are giving us day after day. The interviews are so informative, so amazing, so breathtaking. It's all about all of us. Us being there all the time, looking for help, asking for understanding, not knowing that help might be closer than expected. Now we know, thanks to you. And Ashley wrote, this is a nonstop wealth of information. Hop on the train and catch some of these very informative interviews. It might just blow your mind or your diet out of the water. And the last one, Carolyn wrote, you so rock. 
I am a dietitian, 15 years gluten-free and loving it. It's such a relief to finally have real information to share. Thank you to all who have taken part. You are changing lives around the globe. Love, love, love it. Thank you all very much.